I want to share with you today a relaunch of the branding of Goldfields and what Goldfields stands for. A lot of people have asked me over the last year, what is our stakeholder engagement strategy? What is our policy? What is our strategy? What is our future direction? Where are we going? So it's become evident to the board and to the management of Goldfields that we need to relaunch our brand and what we stand for. A lot of people have asked exactly the kind of questions that I hope this presentation will deal with today. But before we get into what the brand is, first of all, it's appropriate for us to rewind for a moment and see where we've come from. And a lot has happened over the space of just a year. The seminal moment, certainly from my perspective, was a presentation that we were asked to do on the 31st of July last year in Melbourne, What Investors Want, which was a fairly strong attack on the gold industry, of which we are a big part of, in terms of what they haven't done and what they haven't delivered for their investors. That got us thinking ourselves, what does that mean for Goldfields? And we went back and commissioned a detailed review of the entire company's portfolio in the last four months of last year. And for the first time, I think we were the one company who was prepared to stand up and say, actually, it's not just about future growth targets and it's not about growing ounces. It's actually about generating real returns and cash flows for investors that matters. That got us thinking about cutting back production, something that has never been done over the last decade. Everyone's been trying to increase production. People have been seduced by the marginal ounce. Let's make our pitch shells bigger. Let's use a higher price. We can move more material. We can make more profits. And yet we didn't make more profits. We didn't expand our margin when the gold price went up. So we had plans in place to reduce a lot of our marginal production across the group in Australia and in Ghana specifically. And for us to focus not on ounces for ounces sake, but on real cash flows for shareholders. That got us also thinking about the structure of the company and the fact that we had a mix of different kinds of assets. Assets that were very mature and declining. Assets that were growing, assets that were steady. And it seemed to us that mixing these all together in one company wasn't necessarily the ingredients that investors were looking for. It's back to this analysis here. So that resulted in the, I call it the liberation of Sabanya. And it's a liberation because we've spun off assets that have a lot of life left in them and that needed to be managed by a dedicated team that could deploy the cash flows that are made in the best interest of shareholders, either paying them out as a dividend or reinvesting into the future. And it's not a long time since we've had Sabanya in place, but recently, certainly, I don't know if it's still the case today, the pro forma market value of Goldfields and Sabanya together was higher than that of Anglo Gold. And historically, we used to lag our market cap by between 30 and 50% against them. Now, it's easy to say that in a declining market, but on a relative basis, it seems to have found favor with our investors. So that's left Goldfields as a very different company. And we've used the term for the first time, a mid-tier company. We're not as big anymore as what we used to be. And you've heard the term, small is beautiful. Small means we focus. And the degree of focus within Goldfields over the last six months has been very, very significant. The Sabanya deal has helped us to do that. The Sabanya deal has also helped that management team to focus even more on their own assets. So in the fullness of time, I think you'll find that this decision will be borne out by the returns that it generates for shareholders. 
So we've come up then with a strategy for 2013. Our business plan was premised on looking to put cash generation before anything else. <clears throat> and that's more important than long-term growth, and it's more important than building new mines. Let's get the existing portfolio to generate cash. So that's the new paradigm. I must say it's been somewhat fortuitous that we started on this road back in August of last year because none of us could have predicted the sharp decline in the gold price. But had we not done a lot of the work over this period of time, we wouldn't have been in the situation we are now, where I think, <clears throat> by and large, with some work still to be done, we should weather the storm that we're currently in. I don't know how long the storm's going to be, and whether it's going to get worse, and whether it's going to blow harder, but I think we're in much better shape now to, to weather that storm. Our corporate office, as you know, has been rationalized. It's been a very painful process, particularly as all of the people who've been here have been here a long, long time, and we've lost a lot of very good people. Fortunately, some of them could have been redeployed into the regions. Some of them, unfortunately, we had to say goodbye to. That has meant we've also had to refocus on devolving more accountability and authority to the regions. We don't have people at corporate to do the job. The job's got to be done at the rock face. It's got to be done where the mines are. And that process is well underway for us to make sure that we know what we do here in corporate and the regions know what they do. But of course, all of this means that we've had to pause and reflect about who are we today? What were we before? And what should we be going forward? So we've gone through a process over a number of months, the executive, and I must thank uh, Vili and Sven and also Leanne and the HR team with Angela for the excellent work they've done in positioning us that we can roll out what we believe to be the DNA of Goldfields. The glue that holds this company together, the soft woolly stuff that we can't actually touch and feel, but it's in this room, it's in this building, and it's pervasive through the operations. So I'm going to share with you then <clears throat> our views today on our vision, what our values should be, the strategic objective of the company, and then we've come up with a number of charters which set out the key principles about how we deal with our employees, the most important facet of our business, our employees, our stakeholders in the various communities we operate in, governments, communities, suppliers, you name it. Then, of course, the investors. Important we deal with that too. As part of the employee charter, we've also got an employee value proposition, which we're ready to launch. And you'll see how we've consolidated all of the different benefits and values and what we stand for in terms of our people. Then our corporate culture, we're having a stab at trying to show you what we believe it is. And this also reflects input we've been given from a number of people. What is our organizational structure? And then we've put our strategy on one piece of paper. And our intent is that as we get into the 2014 budgeting cycle, that will be used as a key reference point to test whether our plans are achieving the objectives we've set out for ourselves. Lastly, we've got to make sure that our visual identity matches with the corporate philosophy that we're setting out, and we're going to share with you our views on that. We've looked at the vision, and we believe that the vision that we devised as an executive back in 2009 is as valid today as it was then, to be the global leader in sustainable gold mining. And what we want to do is make sure that everyone around the world has one vision, nothing else to be the global leader in sustainable gold mining. Why do we believe it's relevant? The global leader, we don't want to be the biggest, but we want to try and be the best at what we do. Everything we do, we want to be the best. We want to try and get superior returns for our shareholders. That's what we want to do. doesn't matter how big we are. 
What matters to us is the returns we give to our shareholders. We've got to make sure we're the best at dealing with the environment, with safety, health, and their communities. Remember those four non-negotiables we talked about not so long ago. Let's be the best at those, because that will stand the test of time and ensure that our business will be sustainable. And that's the second key leg. Sustainability will be underpinned if we are safe, healthy, environmentally friendly, and we care and interact with the communities around us. Shared value is something that we've started to embrace as a company. A lot of people still don't understand what it means. Simply put, you know, shared value is not about sharing what's already been created. Okay, that's more akin to corporate social investment or philanthropic work or handouts, whatever you want to call it. Shared value is about interacting with those around us, society, communities, to create new value together. And then we can share that value. That's a win-win situation. And there's lots of good examples. Local procurement in the area you operate might be able to reduce the cost of inputs into your business. At the same time, it could create jobs in the area that you operate. That is true shared value. Create something above the baseline, something new. And then gold mining. We're still going to be in gold mining. We've debated this long and hard a number of times. We've decided we are gold miners. We might have some byproduct credits from time to time, like Cerro Corona in Peru, or potentially gold-silver deposits, but we're not going to be mining non-gold deposits that are only non-gold. We will not be doing that. We stick to gold. So this is who we are, what we do, and how we work. These are the key principles. Moving on then to the values, and these values are consistent with what we've had before. The one exception, we've added something in under innovation, a very important thing, acting like owners. We believe that that's a key ingredient to innovation. And the way we're going to become the best at what we do is making sure that we all behave like engaged owners. And in a way, we are, because we do participate in the fortunes of the company through the incentive schemes, or at least most of us do. We've made virtually every employee, certainly in South Africa, an investor in the company. So we are engaged owners. Let's behave like engaged owners. Every rand or dollar we spend, let's ask ourselves, if this was your company, would you be spending it? Are you getting a value? Let's not waste. Let's be efficient. Let's try and behave like we do at home. That's a key part of the message today. The other values are pretty much what you've seen before. Safety, of, of course, is the number one value. And we haven't moved off that statement. Responsibility. We've got to be responsible for the entire array of stakeholders that we interact with, our employees, our communities, our shareholders. We must act with honesty, fairness, integrity, and transparency. And that starts from me down. It doesn't work for me to stand up here and say these things unless I do it as much as you do. Treat each other with respect. Innovative. Encourage people to try things. It's better to try and fail than not to try at all. And I can tell you, I've made a lot of mistakes in the time that I've been in this job. But the important thing is we've tried things, and if they don't work, we move on, and we try different things. And I think that way we can make this a great company. And working together in teams is also a key ingredient to success. And you'll see later on, I'll share with you how we believe that there's an analogy between how lions operate in a pride compared to how we should operate as a company that's successful. Our key strategic objective, first and foremost, is for us to make money. What do we define as making money? 15% margin after everything. Taxes, royalties, capital, the lot. Every operation in our group should strive to achieve at least that because I think that's what's required for us to convince our shareholders that we are a value proposition. 
And this will be a key ingredient of the 2014 business plan. Shared value, I've talked about already. If we're going to be successful in the long term, we can't operate in isolation of society around us. We've got to interact with them in a positive way. We've got to build trust. And we've got to share with our shareholders some of the fruits of what we generate. If we can make cash, we must share with our shareholders part of that cash. If we make earnings, we believe it's still valid today to pay out between 25 and 35 percent of our earnings as a cash dividend. Those are the key ingredients of our strategy. The stakeholder charters I've talked about, first of all, our employees, our commitment to society and communities, and of course, our investors. And we can explore those in a little bit more detail. Now, these will all be embodied in documents that are distributed to everyone. So you don't have to try and remember everything today. I'm trying to give you a sense and a color of what you're going to see in these documents. You want to have a company as employees that you're proud of, that the company lives the values, and that the communities around us look to us and say, this is a company that uh, we like to have around. Investors are proud of what we do too. So the company should be something that we're all proud of, our families, the employees, everyone. It's important also that we celebrate our successes. And successes can be celebrated in any number of ways. It doesn't always have to be monetary benefits. It could be your name put on a board. It could be someone patting you on the shoulder and saying, well done. Um, everyone likes to hear appreciation for what they do, all of us. And that's what we should try and show as a company, is thank people for the good work that they do. We want to make sure that all people are treated with respect and dignity. It doesn't matter the circumstances, how tough things are. We must never forget. That's very important. And non-negotiable, too, is to create a safe and healthy environment for our employees. And anyone who doesn't think we have a safe and healthy environment, please tell me. Or tell your boss. Let's make sure we know about it. We've got to develop people for the future and create new challenges for people. And so often you find that people think they've come to the end of their careers because they're in one mine somewhere and they think that's the end. They've capped out their career at the mine they're in or in this corporate office and they think that's the end. But Goldfields is a much bigger company than a corporate office or any one mine. And we can create opportunities for growth. We can set out a career path for people. And if we're not doing it, come and knock on the door of my door or Leanne's door and let's hear your complaints, because that's what we want to do, is give people a growth path, give people a future. We can't guarantee that people are going to move up the curve, but what we must do is give people a sense of where they can grow to. And we want to make this the best place to work. We want people to be happy in their job. Because all of us spend so much of our day and our week at work. It's terrible if you're not happy doing that. You want to be happy with what you do each and every day. That's very important. So these are some of the key ingredients of our employee charter that we'll be putting out. Something that we've been working on for quite some time, and I'm delighted now, I think we've just about got it right, is our employee value proposition, or EVP as you'll hear it referred to, which sets out for our employees all of the things that the company can do for you. And oftentimes people will come and say, but what about my future? What about my growth? Um, what about my pay? What about my benefits? You don't have to worry anymore. It's all here. And it's all going to be set out very clearly. And I think when you look at it all in totality, you'll find that the company can create enormous value for you as an employee. I hope that you feel that way. And certainly when you've gone through this, and it's something you should be able to read in about an hour or so. If you've got questions, comments, let us hear them. But this gives you a good idea as to why we believe Goldfields is a competitive company to work for and hopefully an exciting company as well. I'm not going to go through all of them. I think they're pretty clear. But it deals with all of the key questions I believe most of you would have. Going on to our society, 
the most important thing with communities is to build trust. That requires interaction and it requires two-way communication. We've got to be listening and we've got to be responding. And the important thing is, whatever we promise the communities, we've got to deliver on. So let's listen, let's build trust, let's look for opportunities for us to create shared value and get a buy-in to what we're doing. And then, more importantly, and this is something we've started doing in our integrated report, and there's more we've got to do on this. Let's baseline where we are and then measure the impact of the initiatives that we're putting in place. Because if you can't measure, you can't manage. So that's going to be a key ingredient. And in essence, <coughs> that summarizes that particular charter. Then we move on to our investors. And I'm going to start from the bottom up on this one for a change. We've got to be very careful about what we promise our investors. And oftentimes, it's better for us to talk about what we've done compared to what we promised to do. And we're going to change our focus more to what we've done as opposed to what we are going to do. Having said that, clearly investors do look for forward-looking information and where they think the company is going. And we've got to be very, very circumspect about what we promise. Because if we don't deliver it, oftentimes investors lose credibility, or investors rather lose trust in the management, and the management loses credibility. And most times people are not buying all bodies in the ground. They're actually buying us. When they buy shares in gold fields, it's a vote of confidence in us. When they sell shares in gold fields, oftentimes it's a vote of no trust in us. That's what it comes down to. So it's all about us delivering on our promises and not making promises we can't keep. We've got to provide returns that should be better than the opposition, than our peer group, on a relative basis, and we should try and see if we can deliver leverage to the gold price and deliver the impact of the gold price to the bottom line. And that the industry, I'm afraid to tell you, has not done for well over a decade. And it's one of the reasons why we're seeing the market values where they are. You know, so when you look at the share price and you see where it is, that is a reflection of what we failed to do relative to what we've promised. It's a reflection of the fact that the gold price has not generated the returns that we would have hoped for. And frankly, even though the gold price has come off somewhat, if four or five years ago I told you the gold price is going to be $1,400 today, you would have been delighted. So forget about the noise of seventeen or 1800 you would have been delighted. So would I. And yet, we find ourselves languishing. We can take charge of that. We can't control the price of our inputs. We can't control the price of our product. What we can control is how we manage our operations, our efficiencies, our productivity, those things. Let's take charge of the things we can manage. And in time, we can be rewarded. So this is the key ingredients of the investor charter. We've had a shot at trying to define our group culture and what we stand for. And again, it comes down to a dynamic, innovative, and entrepreneurial company. And here there is a distinct advantage that we can bring to play. Other people have joined us, or some people who work for us now have joined us from other companies where they claim that there's too much bureaucracy, there's too many layers, they have to present the same thing five times before it gets to approval. Something that's motivated six months ago is only considered by the management. We're trying to be more nimble and fleet-footed than that. We don't have a huge number of management layers. So we can be dynamic. We can be entrepreneurial. We can be innovative. I think it's one of the key ingredients of success for Goldfields. And no surprise again, you're seeing part of this is acting like engaged owners. Executing with a sense of urgency. When we've got a problem, let's deal with it. 
let's get on and do it. And that requires sometimes that we've got to put in extra effort, all of us. But if we do that, we'll see the rewards that we get. I want to try and remove for you, together with the board and the management team, red tape, bureaucracy. I don't think there's any egos left here. I think we've all gone through tough times. If anyone's still got an ego, good luck. Because <laughs> certainly this is not a, a business for sissies. And we know that sometimes things go wrong. But the important thing is, can we dust ourselves off, pick ourselves up, and carry on to the next challenge? That defines winners compared to losers. We say what we mean, and we mean what we say. You know, don't tell your colleagues or your peers or your bosses, you're going to do something and don't do it. Uh, it's an important thing. I think we've got it going particularly well at the moment. And I think the ingredients in this company for us to be successful are already there. We are not far away, I believe, from being a standout company. We want to be a caring organization and we want to be responsive to people's needs. And we want to communicate well. I don't think we've communicated well over the last five years. That's my fault. And we've got to improve it. And we've got to make sure that our employees know what we're doing every step of the way. And I think that way they will feel more engaged. And that is a key objective of the strategy going forward. Now, there's a book that's been written by a chap called Ian Thomas, The Power of the Pride. We're going to have copies available at every mine, every regional office and here at corporate. I really would urge those of you who haven't read it to read it. It's an easy read, actually. You could probably read the guts of it in about an hour and a half. But the similarities between this book and what we're trying to do and what we're trying to achieve are quite interesting. I'm just going to carry on talking while we sort out the technology. <coughs> but in essence, when you read the book, some of the key ingredients that you will see, <laughs> technology, <laughs> some of the key ingredients you will see is that why is the pride successful? And a lot of you have been to the bush, so this is probably something that us in South Africa can understand better than most. And you see how a pride works. Teamwork. If you see them stalking a prey, there are lionesses on the flanks. There's someone going forward. There's someone at the back. They're all looking at each other. They're communicating. They're watching what's going on. The whole team is made up of powerful individuals. Have you seen the, the one rogue lion walking off by himself, looking sorry and sad? He's been pushed out of the pride because he didn't do his job. The pride will not accept weakness in their group. Common goals. They don't get distracted by funny things. You know, people on the side trying to get your focus on this. They are single-minded. Why? Because success is essential for survival. Now, this has never been more relevant than today. <laughs> because for us, if we're going to be successful and stay in business as a company, that's going to be our survival. That's where we are today. So they communicate particularly well together. Training never stops. Training continues. There's a spirit in the pride. There's a trust. And the one thing that we have to remember, we're all in this together. Let's support each other. Let's see how we can get the best out of each other. That is the way that we can be successful. The structure. If you don't have the right structure in the company, you can't be successful. You've got to have the right strategy, but then you've got to have the right structure. Remember, structure follows strategy. If you don't have the right structure, you can't implement the strategy. So these are some of the key ingredients of the book, and I really would urge you to read it. It's an interesting read, and what we're going to try and achieve is to get Ian Thomas to see if he can come and talk to us and maybe go around the world. I really think it would be worthwhile because he's quite a dynamic individual. I have seen his presentation some years ago. And maybe this sounds trite and uh, irrelevant, but it's not, particularly when you see his presentation. Even if we just learn one or two things out of this, I think it can enrich all of us. <coughs> 
And then our structure, I think, now is becoming clearer. We've got a corporate office that's focused on strategy, capital allocation, policy standards, overall stakeholder engagement policies and what have you. We don't have operational people here. They are going to be out at the regions and at the mines. So they're going to be empowered with authority to act within the constraints of the Goldfields framework, the budget, and their long-term plan that they agree with us. So it's a very simple structure, I think, that is becoming more understood. You know where we're operating around the world. I think that's all clear. You've seen all the regions. And here we've summarized our strategy on one piece of paper. How often have you heard someone say, give it to me on one piece of paper? Well, here it is. And if you remember this, this will help us to focus and make sure that everything we do is aligned with us. Operational excellence, that's nothing new. We do our scorecards on this basis, these three legs, growing gold fields and securing the future. Under operational excellence, safe and productive teams, number one. Our philosophy, again, of not ounces for ounces sake, and the 15% margin, cash flow margin after everything, taxes, royalties, the lot, and then paying dividends to our shareholders if we make the earnings. In essence, those are the key ingredients of operational excellence. Growing the company where we can, we'd like to prioritize on smaller but higher grade deposits that we can find in the portfolio. <coughs> Brownfields expansion is always less risky and more likely than Greenfields projects. So we've got to have a mix of both. And whatever we do, we must try and grow our reserves per share and our margin per ounce. And it's not about ounces, it's about cash flow. And this is a major mindset change for us, and I can't re-emphasize this enough, because the industry has all been used to standing on podiums, as they will again this month in Denver, the biggest gold show in the world. And I've been to around about uh, 12 of these <laughs> over the last uh, 16 years, and every CEO of every company stands up and talks about how they're going to grow their production. I wonder what we're going to hear this year. It's going to be very interesting. <coughs> and having interacted with a number of the CEOs uh, a week or so ago in Canada, um, it's clear that everyone is focusing on exactly the same things we are. So the penny is starting to drop. Exploration and development, where possible, will try and self-fund where we can, but we have to accept if we're going to grow, we have to spend some money on exploration. I think growth is not guaranteed, but what must be guaranteed is growth in our cash flow. That's the key ingredient for us. Sustainability, securing the future, what does that mean? It means safety and health. Remember those four non-negotiables, safety, health, environmental stewardship, stakeholder relations. Those first three, non-negotiable, whatever we do. Then human rights, shared value with our communities. There you see it again. Developing our people and attracting and retaining the best talent in the company. Believing in our product and not hedging it. Don't sell it forward. Don't give it away. Don't hock your future. That is not the way we should behave. We should give our shareholders full leverage to the future gold price. That's what we've always stood for. And certainly, I don't believe we should change that. Neither does the management team. So there's a strategy on one piece of paper that reflects the glue that holds us together, how we should operate our business. Now, what we're going to do as well is get a corporate identity manual put together. And we're going to ask, please, that this is the one area where we shouldn't deviate one millimeter in terms of our signage. We've got to make sure that there's one Goldfields brand, there's one Goldfields logo. We've also looked at the logo, and we've stuck with it after a lot of debate. And I think it's good that we've had a healthy debate. But we have to look at all of our operations, and this is not so relevant to you, because I think we've got it right here in the corporate office. We've got to look at all of our operations and make sure that we capture this correctly. We're going to graduate away from .co.za to .com. That's very, very exciting. And that will give us much greater exposure to people all over the world. 
We've also got uh, the intranet and the DNA website will be set up as well. And there's a lot of other stuff that we're going to do to make use of technology. Um, I have to say, social media um, bothers me in a sense in that I think it's quite easy for us to, it to be misused for the wrong things. But we can't stay here when the whole world is moving forward. So we are going to start using uh, LinkedIn in terms of maybe communicating various uh, messages, policies, procedures, and we'll see how we go. Um, I guess in five years' time, uh, all of us will be operating as though social media uh, was always here. It's like cell phones, right? Mm -hmm. uh, who hasn't got one? Everyone's got one. So maybe we just got to get up to speed on all of this. We're going to be doing a review of all of our stationery, making sure that it reflects what we are. So we're going to ask people to make sure, and here I'm going to be looking at all of our PAs in particular, to make sure we have the right stationery that reflects one version of what Goldfields is. It doesn't matter where you are, whether you're in Peru, whether you're in Australia, whether you're in Johannesburg. We're going to improve our communication, as I said earlier, give you more and give you more more often. And we're going to urge you to look at things like the intranet, various presentations we put out. We'll give you flags that there's this on the website, there's this interesting article, so that you're informed. We want to try and get people as informed as we possibly can. I think the magazine has been a great success, The New Age, and uh, Sven and his team do a wonderful job. Um, we're going to keep trying to improve that uh, in whatever way we can. And again, if there's any particular comments or suggestions for improvement, please feel free to, to let us know. All right. So how do we roll this all out? Well, first of all, it's the launch which is taking place now. And I think you've heard the gist of what we want to do. We're going to then have a number of modules because it's a lot to digest in one go. So the first one is more about who we are, what we do, and how we work, expanding on what I've told you today. That will also be this month. Understanding our business and giving you much more information about the company. That will be October. November, the employee value proposition we talked about. We'll make sure that's rolled out. And then before we go off for Christmas, we'd like to sum up and recap where we are. And going forward, this won't be a once-off event. I think we want to have refreshers as much as we can. New people come in. Um, when we have these coffee sessions in the future, we hope that the questions will change from, you know, what is our stakeholder engagement strategy? What is our future direction to? Well, I see you say this, but what about this? Or I like that, or I don't like this. Because then we've got a reference point. We've got a marker that people can comment on. So a lot of work has been done, and a lot of work is still going to be done from here to roll all of this out. And I must thank, uh, again, uh, Vili and his team, and also Leanne and everyone else who've worked tirelessly over the last few months to put this together. I think it really is top quality. And with that, I want to thank you for your time and see if there's any questions. All clear. Maybe, maybe I can, for the benefit of everyone, maybe the, could you give us a bit of an update on, on South Deep? I know it's not directly related, but we've gone through a lot of restructuring and, yeah. and South Deep, we've obviously changed the goalposts a bit. Will have an impact on the staff structures. Maybe you can spend a minute or two talking about it. Sure. The one thing at South Deep that um, <clears throat> has started to become more of a concern, and we debated it with the board literally two weeks ago, is that the build-up is taking longer than what we had hoped it would. And that's not that there isn't a build-up. There is. And I must say, if I look at the momentum over the last six months or so, the momentum is there. The de-stress, which is essentially the opening up of the ore body for future mining and creating the crisscross development for the open stoping, which will be the bulk of the mining technique in the future, is progressing well. It's building up nicely. But it's not building up quickly enough to support the build-up. Every month we're getting new records of de-stress square meters. 
But looking where we are relative to where we need it to be, our feeling is we're going to be late on the build-up. Obviously, we've made that disclosure to the market. And in some respects, I think that's one of the reasons you've seen our share price take a pounding since we announced our results, uh, as I thought it would. The fact that South Deep looks like it's going to be late. Maybe the fact that we didn't pay a dividend as well. And maybe because we could be issuing shares to fund the Barrick acquisition could be another reason. The fact that we made a loss for the quarter could be the final reason. But nevertheless, this has impacted us. And um, that's not to say that the team is not very, very focused on where they're going. And the most important short-term target for South Deep is to get to cash break even. That is the target that Harbour Mobello and his team have been set. So with that in mind, they are re-looking really at the total organizational design and structure to see how it needs to be looked at in the context of that short-term objective. And so there is going to be restructuring at South Deep, like there has been everywhere else. This corporate office has gone through painful restructuring. Australia has reduced their complements by 24%. Uh, Ghana are going to be going through restructuring, particularly as uh, Demang has been losing money. And Ghana is going to close the heap leach operations at the end of the year. So they are going to go through restructuring. And that's been pretty much communicated to the staff. So it is a tough time for them. <clears throat> but I do think in the long run, I've got every confidence that South Deep will be the mine that we always thought it would. And the ore body certainly hasn't changed on us. And if the ore body had changed, it would be a much more difficult situation. But certainly the broken grades we're getting are reflecting what the ore body tells us they should be. We've got problems with logistics underground. We can't get the ore out of the mine. We're breaking the ore at the face. We can't get it out of the mine. Why is that? Because of equipment availabilities that are not where they should be. And that's, again, a lack of maintenance capacity <clears throat> in the mine and a lack of ore pass development, which has come too late for us. We're sitting with six ore passes. We probably need to have nine ore passes. And the good news is we're going to have one of them coming within the next eight weeks. We'll have another one coming early in the new year. That's the good news. That will help. Equipment availabilities, it's a high focus area for the mine. But the good news is we know what the problems are. And we have plans in place to address them. So I'm very confident of the future of South Deep, and I think we'll get it right. It's a tough operation to get to where we wanted to get to, but the prize is big. And the team is very, very determined to get there. I hope that answers your question. Nick, you've been in Australia for a week this past week. You don't have buyer's remorse? Not at all. In fact, um, I must say the, I, I was at the Down Under conference and did a presentation on Wednesday on resource nationalism, which I think is on the website, isn't it? Yeah. So people can have a look at that. <clears throat> I've done that presentation at Gibbs around about three weeks ago. Uh, did it to a packed audience on Wednesday. In fact, there was a whole line of people standing at the back as well because there wasn't enough seating space. So we must have had about five or 600 people listening to the presentation uh, as well. Got a lot of good feedback on that. So I urge you to have a look at it. Um, a lot of good feedback on the, the Barrick acquisition. Uh, a lot of people felt it was a logical deal for us to do. Um, a lot of people felt that um, we got it cheap. Uh, I was with Jamie Sikalski in Vancouver um, the week last weekend, not this weekend, now the previous weekend, and um, him and I spent some time together. He's the CEO of Barrick and said to me, well, Nick, I think you've got these assets pretty cheap. Um, but from my side, I had to do something. I had a strategy to, to sell. I've sold. And, you know, if there's value on the table that you can grab, that's great for the employees and for the industry in Australia. Also sat with the Premier of Western Australia at the dinner and he's very excited about us becoming the second highest producer. Certainly if you look at last year's numbers, we're the second highest producer in Australia. 
and it certainly gives us a springboard to, to capture a lot of values. Um, I didn't go to the new mine sites this time around, but I did meet the general manager and his team uh, at Lawless, who came across to Agnew when I was there, and um, I met Matt O'Hara and, and his team, and they said they're very excited about working together. And the comment he made was, when the announcement came out on the wires on Thursday two weeks ago, he said there was a gentle relief that just went through the mine. Is number one, they were glad something had happened because there's nothing worse than uncertainty. And number two, they were glad it was us and not some of the other people who were potential buyers. So they're looking forward to working with us. It's going to be a lot of work for us to extract the value. And Richard and his team already fired up looking at all of that. But for them, they've now got potentially a one million ounce region. That's quite a lot of toys to play with. So I think they're going to have some fun. So by and large, I haven't had anyone say to me, what the hell did you do there, Dick? <laughs> Anything else, folks? Yes, ma'am. You mentioned um, the 15% margin, and I suppose the answer would differ from region to region, but how close are we to achieving that? We're quite some ways off. We're probably less than half of that now. And next year's plans are going to be done at 1,300 gold, US dollar. So we've got work to do. It's going to require us to work hard. And the message I've given to all of the managers around the world, the regional managers, is we've got to mold our business to make money. And if it means we have to reduce more marginal production and shrink, I call it shrink to grow. Now, maybe shrink some of the production base to grow the profitability of the company, then we have to be alive to that possibility. Uh, so I think it's still going to be a tough call for us to achieve that. But again, it's very necessary if we're going to get faith back into, into the stock. Do you have a timeline on that? I'd like the 2014 budgets to reflect that. So um, again, that's not going to be easy. So we'll see if we can get there. I think some of the operations can get there already. You know, places like uh, Peru, Agnew in Australia are, are there. Uh, they can make it. Um, but there are challenges with other areas. I mean, there are tax challenges. In some jurisdictions, the tax bill is disproportionately high uh, relative to other jurisdictions. So it's not going to be easy. So the, our work is not done yet. But I think at least all of the work I've set out for you has given us a head start on where we want to get to. Good question. Thank you. Anything else, folks? Are we fired up? <laughs> Are we ready to give it a go? Yes. Nothing else? Well, thanks very much once again for your attendance and for your commitment and support. Thank you.